Welcome, everybody. Welcome to God's health plan for you. And let us all praise the Lord and give him thanks together. And remember, as it reads in 3 John, verse 2, brothers and sisters, beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in good health, even as thy soul prospers. So again, this is God's health plan for you. I wish you well, and I greet you with love, joy, and peace in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And let's um, look at health from the approach of God's eyes and understand that he wants all of us to be in good health, and he also wants everyone to prosper. So we're going to talk um, today's message uh, will be about fasting, but I just want to go over what health is again to keep us reminded that health is the condition of being sound in body, mind, and spirit. It is a balanced state of well-being. And when we have our physical health, which is our body, that's our physical health and our environment and what you do, your intake of your food, your rest, your sleep, that's for your body. Your mind is our emotional and our mental health and our mindset and our stability. We want all of that going well with us and our spirit, our soul, our prosperity and our soul salvation, eternity we're looking for with the Father. So that is a balanced state of well-being of mind, body, and spirit. And that's what Good Health Plan is all about. So I pray everyone is doing well to the best of your ability and with what you have. And remember, if you need help, do not feel inhibited about um, asking somebody, your neighbor, a relative, or a friend. Do not sit there and be idle by because remember God wants you to be well he wants the best for you so it's out there there's resources for you to uh, have a better life whether it's food clothes job prosperity he wants us to prosper so go out there and seek it and ask the father amen amen okay we're going to get ready to get started for today's message today's topic is about fasting, fasting. And it's a, a, a very broad topic, a very detailed topic, and a very interesting topic because a lot can be taught and can be spoken about and taught about about fasting. And it can't all be done in this half hour show, two half hour shows, because it's so much, only because there are also so many Bible references to give and talk about fasting. But I'm just gonna start it off with fasting, by definition, by definition, is to abstain from food, okay? That's the definition of fasting, to abstain from food. Now, fasting is also a sacred custom of cleansing oneself and drawing close to God. So the purpose of fasting, when you're fasting, you're doing what? We're abstaining from food, abstaining from eating. And when we abstain from eating, we're replacing that eating or that food or that meal time with time with God, whether it's through prayer, meditation, reading the Bible, reading the scriptures, even singing psalms and songs and praises, okay? We're replacing that time of the abstinence of food with time with God. So it's fasting and prayer that goes together, okay? Fasting and prayer join together. And this helps to strengthen and grow your relationship, our relationship, my relationship with God. Because every new believer, every believer, every born again Christian, we are to, to uh, keep an ongoing relationship with God. And one of the best ways to do that is through prayer. And even fasting goes along with prayer. It cleanses oneself and draws us near to God. Fasting is an act of obedience to God. Okay, and obedience to God, because what does it do when you fast and you're praying, you're believing in something? So it undoes unbelief. Amen. Because we're going through fasting, we're having prayer, and we're making sure that we're growing in our faith with God. So by doing so, we are demolishing unbelief. Amen. Because we believe it in God for purposes and for specific reasons for our prayer and our fast. One reason a person fasts and prays is to cleanse their body and free their mind, okay? Because you're cleansing your body, and by abstaining from, let's say, if I abstain from that meal, that lunch, or that dinner, or that breakfast, you're abstaining from that meal, so therefore your thought isn't on 
preparing that meal, going out to lunch to buy that meal, cooking that meal. Your mind is on God. So it's taking out time and room to make time and room for God to come in. Okay. So it frees your mind of, of those responsibilities, let's say, and, and, and those ways and that time you put in your mind for God. Now, under a normal circumstance, when a person fasts, we have to humble ourselves. Amen. We have to humble ourselves and pray and repent. And that's another part of fasting. We have to pray and we have to repent. Okay. When we pray and when we repent, then we're, we're humbling ourselves to God because we're making him aware that we're aware of what we're fasting and praying for and that we're humbling ourselves. And uh, when we repent, we have to be honest and sincere with God. Okay. And cause I can remember when I was younger and growing up in Catholic school, we had to go to confession several times of the year and they would bring us together by groups and line us up outside in the church and outside the confession box. And, you know, bless me father for our sin. And sometimes we're trying to think of something to say. And as little children, you know, uh, we did have, uh, things to confess, you know, we did share it and he gave us our repentance, say two how fathers, take three Hail Marys. And, and that was a good thing because it made us focus, it made us conscious and aware of um, trying to do good and try to do better in life. So the same thing even now, um, being older, it humbles ourselves because we go before God aware that we are asking for forgiveness of our sins. We are repenting. And then when we do that, God is pleased and God is impressed because he already knows what we've done because he's omnipotent God. He's the omnipresence God. He's everywhere, all knowing, also omniscient. But he, by us coming forward and speaking it and repenting it, we're letting him know that we're acknowledging that we've done wrong. We're acknowledging that we need his forgiveness and to grow a stronger relationship with him. And when we do this, God becomes impressed, and then he even begins to move more in our life and events in our personal life when he really truly sees our sincerity in fasting and in prayer. So that's the good part of fasting. It helps us to remove um, some areas out of us so that we can have that time and focus with God. Fasting will put you in a position of higher faith. Because you're believing in something, you're believing on something, you're believing on God for something, okay? And fasting, like I said, puts us in high, higher faith with God because we believe in God, we have that relationship, but there's something that precedes that because you have to have the relationship with God and you have to believe in his son, Jesus Christ, okay? And you have to know, as Jesus said, nobody comes to the Father but by me. Um, I am the, you know, the way I am the truth in their life. Okay. Nobody gets to the father, but through me. And you have to believe on his son, Jesus Christ. You have to believe in, uh, the laws and commandments that Jesus Christ gave us. And you have to believe on him. But also before we go praying, remember Jesus taught us how to pray. And he also said, um, before we go to the father, we have to ask for forgiveness. So that's why we have to humble ourselves and repent because if not only we asking God for forgiveness for us, we have to forgive others. And as it reads in Matthew chapter six, verse 14 and 15, Jesus said to disciples, he said it, for if you forgive men their trespasses and their trespasses against you, your heavenly father will also forgive you. OK, so if we're asking God to forgive us, he's looking in our heart. He's looking in our spirit. He's looking in our actions to see how we forgiven our enemies, those people that need forgiveness from us. Are we doing the same thing? Then our heavenly father sees us and then he can, you know, receive our prayers and begin to answer our prayers more readily because he sees our true nature, our sincerity in our heart. We have to have a forgiving heart with people. It's not easy. It takes time to do it. I had to learn and grow in forgiving people, forgiving enemies, but it can be done. And the sooner you adapt to it and change to it and do it and really understand why you're doing it, the better you become at it. 
you know, I had to read the scriptures, even if you read first Corinthians chapter 13, um, it talks about love. OK, you might not like everything a person does, but it does talk about love and what love is. OK, it's not being boastful, proudful, not wishing wrong against your neighbor. It tells you a full chapter about what love is. It is not just a written love. It's God's love. And we have to adapt ourselves to God's love towards people. And it takes time doing that. So when we have um, an understanding of that and we go before our father, he begins to forgive us. Okay. So remember that we have to forgive because we're asking for forgiveness. And when fasting also can be for when we have like an uns a big, big problem, some insur insurmountable problem in our life that we should first fast and pray. Because a lot of times we fall, I don't want to say guilty of it, but we fall prone to it just starting off in prayer. You know, a certain way we have to approach God when we're going in prayer. You have to give him praise. You have to give him thanks. You have to ask for forgiveness. You have to humble yourself before you come to the Father. There are several, several steps to prayer and a good uh, prayer life from the Father, you know, when it comes to answered prayer. And God answers prayers, but it might not always be in our timing as we perceive and as we want it to be. And we think it's going to come this way. We think it's going to happen this way. We're praying for something to happen, something to stop happening, something to not be done. And we're just thinking God is going to do it that way. And when it doesn't happen, we say, oh, God didn't answer my prayer. But we have to understand our prayer has to be relevant in what God has on a path for our lives, okay? And I'll get into that later. But just like if I'm, I don't need to pray for a fishing rod and worms and bait if I'm not a fisherman, okay? I have no need for that. But what I have need and prayer for is is what's what's in alignment with my life that God has me on that path. So whatever path I'm on, and if I'm understanding it, and if I'm in prayer with God, well, through fasting, we get those revelations from the spirit of God. Amen. So that's why fasting is good because it takes away and it clears out all the cobwebs and all of the clutter that might be in your mind and your brain, and it leaves the mind open for the awareness of the Holy Spirit to come in upon you and put you on that right and good path. And that's when they say you can hear from the Holy Spirit. You can understand the guidance that is being given to you. You can know that it's God. If somebody walks up to you with something or a suggestion or something that to do, you know, or like sometimes we might say, oh, now that's confirmation. I know that came from God. Yes, because we are spiritually in tune with God's spirit. So prayer and fast. Before we attempt to resolve our problems, go into a prayer, go into a fast. We have needs for things. We can go to the Father and ask him, but have a prayer and have a fast. And we'll talk about different types of fasts a little later on. But prayer and fasting, those go together, okay? Fasting and prayer humbles the person before God. And uh, that's in Psalm 35, 13. And we can see those scriptures later. You can read them later. But Psalm 35, 13 talks about the person humbling themselves before God in prayer. Okay, fasting and prayer chastens the soul. Okay, so what is meant by chastening the soul? When God chastens the soul, or when we're, we're being chastened, we're being corrected by God, okay? And when we go before him and in a fast, and we're abstaining from food, okay, we're allowing our time now is being replaced instead of with eating or with food, with prayer and fasting with God. And let me say this, sometimes you ever open up your Bible and a scripture opens up and it's like, wow, this is just what I was going through today or this is just what I went through yesterday or I need this for tomorrow. That's the Holy Spirit's guidance, okay? And that's your understanding and awareness when you're fasting and praying because uh, your mind is more open and it's more in tune to the Holy Spirit, and you can see and read and understand and know that that's for you. Fasting, it manifests sincerity before God to the 
exclusion of other things, okay? Fasting, you're, you're supposed to just devote just that time with God, okay? If I know that I eat breakfast at 7 o'clock and I'm abstaining and my fast is to forego breakfast and wait to eat from dinner to dinner or from 12 noon and then again at dinner, if I'm abstaining from breakfast from 6 a.m. to 12 a.m., well, that time that I normally sit down to eat, I will go in the room or wherever you have your prayer or your, your private time with God. And you sit down and you read a scripture and you go in prayer because you might not always be home. You might be on a job because if your church or if you have a, a fast a call, you might be at your job or at your workplace or at school somewhere. You might have to go into the restroom or go into a private corner or go around the corner or go into a private spot on a job and have that pri private, quiet time with the Lord. I can remember like 30 years ago, even long while, yeah, about 30 years ago at one of my jobs, um, I noticed that one of the supervisors at a certain time of the day, she would always go past my desk and I would see her go by and I thought she was going to lunch. But then when I went in the lunchroom, I didn't see her in there. But then after about 15, 20 minutes, I saw her walk past again and I'm like, where was she at? Okay. But then one time I needed some supplies for the office. And when I went to the supply closet, she was in there and she was in prayer. And I said, oh, wow, I'm sorry. I apologize. And so I said that to, to say, wherever you can find that quiet place to have that secret, quiet time with God, it's okay. Establish that for you and yourself and you and God. And God sees that and he receives that and he recognizes that, okay? And uh, that's your time that you're sharing with God and you're opening up and you're humbling yourself with him. Fasting shows obedience and may give... Um, the digestive system arrest, okay? <laughs> because fasting is abstaining from eating, okay? So it's giving the body a rest. Usually you might be eating nonstop throughout the day. And just think, the body goes through a lot of work when we eat, okay? That stomach is intaking food. The intestines is grinding the food and sorting it out and put, you know, it's a lot of work that our body goes through. So it's giving the digestive system a rest. I'm just going to read something from Matthew chapter 6, verse 16 to 18. Let me just get this Bible. And Matthew chapter 6, verse 16 to 18. Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood have not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter on this rock. I will build my church and the gates of Hades would not prevail against it. That's bringing awareness to uh, God. I don't know if I have the right uh, scripture with that, but I read it anyway. It's God's word, so it's good. Okay, but I'm going to continue on. Fasting crucifies all of the appetites, okay? It denies them so you can give your entire time and prayer to God, okay? So in Matthew, another verse in Matthew, verse 4, chapter 4, verse 1 through 11, I will read that. Matthew chapter 4, verse 1 through 11. A very familiar scripture, okay? Because um, I'm sure you're aware of what's happening and I'll let you know what that is. Okay. Because this is the scripture when Jesus was led up in the wilderness. Okay. And I'm going to read it again. Fasting crucifies all of the appetites. It denies them. So you can give your entire time and prayer to God, your entire time and prayer to God. So then Jesus was led up by the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and afterwards he was famished. And in another gospel, they said he hungered. So um, 
in the different gospels, they'll express that a little differently, but we understand for 40 days and 40 nights, and there's different types of fast, different amount of days and different amount of times. Be careful with the fast that you choose to do, okay? So the tempter came and said to him, if you are the son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. And who was the tempter? We want to say the devil, Lucifer, okay? So he came and tempted him. If you are the son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, Jesus answered, it is written, one does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And then the devil took him to a holy city. But just to go back to that scripture, one does not live by bread alone, but by every word that cometh from the mouth of God. So now when we fast, what are we doing? We're abstaining from food. And when we abstain from food, we're not eating, okay? And we're um, using that time that we use to eat, to do what? To read the word of God, to be in word with God, to understand the word of God, okay? And it, it denies them so you can give your time to prayer with God, okay? So now Jesus, we know in the Gospel of John, it starts out that Jesus was, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word was God. Jesus is the Word, okay? Jesus was there in the beginning. He knows the Word of God. So when he's tempted by the devil, not only through fasting, but by fasting and being one with God and drawing into the Spirit, he's also drawing in with the Word of God. So by him saying, one does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God, that's taken right from Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3. So if you go to Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3, it says just that, that one does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. So by us even fasting, and substituting that breakfast time, that lunch time, that dinner time, that time that we would be eating, we're abstaining from food, we're replacing it, we're filling it with studying the word, understanding the word, and having a relationship with God. We are intaking the word of God. So that way, when we need to, in times, we're able to pour out what has been intaken of us, because it can't come out of you if it's not in you. When you're in school and you study for a test, if you didn't study those vocabulary words the night before, those sentences the night before, when you go to take the test, you have a pen in your hand, but you can't write nothing down because you didn't study anything. You didn't take nothing in. So you can't put nothing out. So the same thing when you're replacing that time from eating and that time to study the word of God or any other time, not only when you're fasting, by you reading and studying the word of God, then it can come out of you. Amen. So Jesus is only speaking his own word because this is the word of God. So now the devil goes on to tempt him in verse five. Then the devil took him into the holy city and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple and saying to Jesus, and he knows this is Jesus, the son of God. Okay. Cause he was there. He got knocked down out of heaven. So he know who Jesus is, but this shows you how stupid the devil is. He's still trying to tempt him. OK, and he's saying, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you and on their hands. They will bear you up so that you would not dash your foot against the stone. So where's that word coming from? If you OK, a very familiar and famous Psalm, Psalm 91. OK. Starting at verse 11, and I'm reading it verbatim. And you can do this even at home, have both pages side by side, and it reads the same. He will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways, okay? And on their hands, they will bear you up so that you would not dash your foot against the stone. And see, the devil is very cunning because he knows some of these words of scriptures and he will leave out some parts and even alter them okay so we have to be careful when um to know like they say false prophets uh people that claim to know the word or claim to be preaching to you you know one-on-one -on -one in the store or here or there whatever you you have to know the word of god for yourself read it and understand it 
by Jesus fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was filling up with the spirit, filling up with the word of God. And so then Jesus said to him again, it is written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Okay. So he's telling him he will command his angels, like throw yourself over the cliff. Doesn't it say in the word of God that he will have his angels swoop down and grab you up and whatever? Jesus said, hey, yeah, but don't put the Lord your God to the test. Just because it says that and he will do it, don't test him that way. Okay? And he knew the word of God. And he said, again, it is written. And I like doing that sometimes, preaching or whatever. And you see, I'll make references to the Bible because this is where I'm getting the messages from. This is where I'm studying from. This is what I'm speaking. So I'll even say, it is written or go to this verse, go to this scripture. And again, Jesus the devil took him on a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said to him, all these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Huh. Oh, really? So now Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan, for it is written, okay? Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And again, that's in Deuteronomy chapter 8, um, verse 13. Worship the Lord your God only. So he's trying to tell him, if you bow down and worship me, I will give you all of this. All of that is not for his to give, number one. So you know he's a phony right there. The, the devil has nothing to give you. This, all of this, yeah, no, he can't do that. And Jesus said, again, it is written. So we have to know the word of God and study the scriptures and understand through fasting and prayer. Okay, see this Holy Bible? And I got another Bible here. I have one on a job. I have one in this bag. But understand and study the scriptures for yourself. Again, it denies them so you can give your entire time in prayer to God. Fasting crucifies all of the appetites, okay? And so you see, fasting, it demonstrates the mastery of man over his appetites, and aids him in freeing himself of temptation to help to attain power over demons, okay? So by Jesus fasting, it helped him to master his mind over matter, okay? Even like if I go in a store, do I need to buy these potato chips? Do I need to buy these cupcakes? Do I need to buy this candy? I might like to because I like them, they're tasty, whatever, but I don't need them. So I have to master my mind over the physical right there. So you see fasting demonstrates the mastery of man over his own appetites and aids in freeing himself up. So now of temptations, those are my temptations. So now I'm able to conquer my temptations because I have strength and power through my fasting and prayer. So I just want to share that with you about fasting. I think that might be uh, where I have to end this topic uh, for this show. I don't want to run out of time and into time, but um, I have to cut it off here and we're going to do a continuation on to the next show. Okay. God bless you. Okay. And when you go with God, God will go with you. Remember, let go and let God. God bless you. Okay. Amen. Amen.